Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we're going to start on a new expedition and our expedition is going to be the DeSoto Expedition. It is named after Hernando de Soto who was a Spanish explorer. He was born in Spain in 1495. He came to the New World in the 1520s and was active early on in Panama and Central America. In 1530, he led an expedition up the Yucatan Peninsula in search of a waterway to the Pacific Ocean. De Soto became famous for accompanying Pizarro in the conquest of Peru, and uh, if you know your South American history there, that was the defeat of the Inca Empire. In 1536, De Soto did not receive a promotion while in Peru, so he went ahead and returned to Spain. Now at this time, as you'll recall from some earlier lessons, King Charles was the ruler of Spain, and De Soto approached King Charles and asked if he could be appointed governor of Guatemala. King Charles instead made him governor of Cuba, and King Charles gave him instructions to colonize North America within four years. Now, at this time, De Soto was just learning of Cabeza de Vaca's travels. Cabeza de Vaca had just come back from that lengthy journey in the New World. And of course, if you're just joining us, we just spent five episodes talking about it, so you'll have to go back and listen to those. And De Soto was very interested in Cabeza de Vaca's travels and in fact he went so far as to offer Cabeza de Vaca a job on this new expedition. Let's take a look at the reading. Don Hernando de Soto was desirous that Cabeza de Vaca should go with him and made him favorable proposals but after they had come upon terms they disagreed because the Aladantado would not give the money requisite to pay for a ship that the other had bought. So a dispute there over ships, and it appears as if had De Soto agreed to pay for a, a ship that I guess Cabeza de Vaca had owned, or vice versa, I don't know, I don't know which, uh, Cabeza de Vaca could have been heading back to uh, the southeastern United States. So in April of 1538, De Soto leaves Spain for the New World with an expedition that includes over 600 men. Before heading into the southeast, they first arrive at Santiago where they're welcomed by the village there. The Portuguese sailor that is with uh, De Soto, he actually ends up writing a vol the volume that we're going to be reading from, but he makes some observations about Santiago that I want to share. Let's have a look. The city of Santiago consists of about 80 spacious and well-contrived dwellings. Some are built of stone and lime, covered with tiles. The greater part have the sides of board and the roofs of dried grass. There are numerous cattle and horses in the country, which find fresh grass at all seasons. From the many wild cows and hogs, the inhabitants everywhere are abundantly supplied with meat. So, you know, we've talked in prior episodes about the New World, and we had the Columbus unit a while back. And there were a lot of struggles going on, but it seems like in the city of Santiago, things are going apparently pretty well. The, the sailor who's writing here goes on to mention that bread of the, of the country, which is of Cuba, is made from a root that is peeled and crushed in a press. He goes on to describe the bread is of little taste and nourishment. Uh, bread consisting of root is something totally new for me, but apparently it was commonplace in 16th century Santiago. So this Portuguese sailor makes another comment about Santiago, and it sounds similar to Bartolome de las Casas. Let's have a look. Although the earth contains much gold, there are few slaves to seek it, many having destroyed themselves because of the hard usage they receive from the Christians in the mines. 
So again, another observation we're seeing of the natives in the New World essentially being worked to death. So from Santiago, the expedition travels to Havana. And in Havana, the author notes that alligators threaten the people, and the other threats are wild dogs, which attack some of the livestock, including pigs. And again, another interesting note of, uh, of a colony, it being Havana. The group leaves Havana on May 18, 1539, and they spot land, which would be the Florida Peninsula, on May 25th, so they're out there for about a week. The group came ashore, and immediately they skirmish with natives, they drive the natives off, and then they make an interesting discovery. Let's have a look. As soon as we went on shore, we found out from some Indians taken that there was a Christian in the country, one of the people who had come into it with Panfilo de Narvaez, and we started in search of him. We met him on the way. He came naked like them with a bow and some arrows in his hands. Now keep in mind, they've found a man, appears to be living with the natives, and it's been 12 years since the Narvaez expedition was in Florida. The survivor has also learned the native language and can actually communicate freely with natives. It took him four days to get back into the practice of speaking any Spanish. The man's name was Juan Ortiz. Juan Ortiz was one of the 20 to 30 men that Narvaez sent into the interior of Florida ahead of his own expedition, and you'll recall that from our Narvaez unit. He says that the group was taken prisoner by a village of natives, and at the time of their taking, being taken prisoner, one of the Europeans was killed. At one point, this man was set to be burned to death, and they had tied him up and had him suspended over a pile of wood. And as the fire was starting, the daughter of the chief pleaded for this man's life. He was actually then ordered to do some work for the natives. He was ordered to watch a temple at night. And in doing this, he gained the trust of the chief and the tribe. Ortiz goes on to tell the group that three years into his stay, the town was attacked by the Mococo tribe. And the chief that he had uh, befriended fled. The daughter of the chief suggested to Ortiz that he defect to the Mococo tribe, which he did in the middle of the night. When the man arrived, when Ortiz arrived at the village, he scared the natives to the point where they were prepared to kill him when one of the natives understood the language Ortiz was speaking and they readily accepted him in. And when I read this, I got the impression that the two tribes spoke two different languages. Ortiz pledged his oath to this tribe, and he ended up living with them and moving around as he pleased. So, essentially, if you're wondering whether or not assimilation was something that could occur in the 16th century, I think it's safe to say that Juan Ortiz was able to pull it off. And so when you get later into history and the speculation surrounding the Roanoke colony comes about and people talk about natives that look like they are of European uh, mix, it's very well likely that those circumstances could have been true, but they could have been true because of 16th century exploration and had nothing to do with the Roanoke colony. Juan Ortiz continues three more years into his time in Florida, and he says that he received word three years, so this would be six years after he was left there, 
uh, he received word that ships had been spotted near the shore. He rushed out of the village to the shore, which was probably several miles, and nothing was there. He was embarrassed by this because he thought it may have been a test of faith by the natives, and he was very concerned about returning. Yet the chief and the tribe brought him back in. So when news arrived to their village that these men arrived, the DeSoto expedition, Ortiz told the chief that his allegiance was to him and the tribe. But then the chief told him, told Ortiz, that if he wanted to leave, he could leave. And that's how Juan Ortiz lived amongst the natives of Florida for, I believe it was 12 years total. Juan Ortiz would join the DeSoto expedition and he would serve as an interpreter. And this is pretty important because now you have somebody who you know that could speak the language. DeSoto then sends a man named De Galagos to the interior of Florida, where they came to the town of Paracoxi. And the chief of this town was absent and not able to appear due to illness, and this is according to the natives. After some time with these natives, though, uh, De Galagos believes they're stalling him, that it's a stalling tactic. So he orders that the natives be chained together. The villagers there did share that they were at war with another group of natives who wore golden hats. So if we know anything about these Spanish expeditions into the lower 48, all you got to do is say the word gold and you're going to get people's attention. So DeSoto finds out about this and uh, he leaves 100 men on the shore and takes the rest of the men and marches inland to meet De Galagos. They merge and go towards this other tribe known as the Kale, when they get there, they find the town abandoned. They continue to a grain field where DeSoto orders some grain to be gathered, which, you know, for an expedition of some 600 men, you're going to need a lot of food. And in the process of this, natives were hiding and actually came out and ambushed the expedition, killing three members. One of the captured natives told DeSoto that they were seven days away from the town of Appalachie. Now, if you'll recall, Appalachie was a key destination point to the Narvaez expedition. And DeSoto was very, very familiar with Appalachie, having talked to Cabeza de Vaca. And so on August 11th, DeSoto leaves Kale and heads for Appalachia. They come upon a village not not the village they're going for, where the chief tries to run away and he gets tracked down by one of the dogs in the expedition. So it was, you know, by by the chains and the, the, the dogs being sent on, uh, essentially in this case, a native chief, DeSoto is not uh, coming into these native territories with necessarily a feeling of warm diplomacy and uh, and we'll see how that you know turns out as he goes further and further inland on the 17th of August they arrive at a town called Caliquin where again they hear from the natives about this town of Appalachian as they're leaving Caliquin they discover that there is no clear road or path to the town so they have to kind of change direction to try to find an easy way to get into Appalachian. You have to remember Florida, and it's and in some parts are still this way today, very swampy, uh, very tough terrain. This isn't something where you just go from point A to point B. So now they're struggling to find Appalachian, and they're going through a lot of small villages. They get to September 15th, so a seven-day journey is turned into a 35-day journey, and they arrive at a town called Naptaka. And in that town, the natives beg for the release of the Caliquin chief, which DeSoto took with him a little ways back. And I note this because it appears as if while there were villages and some chiefs, there were people that were in charge that appeared 
to rule over a decent sized providence. And this chief of the Caliquin becomes sort of the first evidence of that. So DeSoto refuses to release the chief. And Juan Ortiz, our interpreter from the Narvaez expedition, either through eavesdropping or assimilation or whatever, he learns of a plot to recapture the chief. And he alerts DeSoto. And so as, as this is occurring, uh, DeSoto gathers his men to prepare and ends up facing off against 400 natives gathered to fight for the release of the chief. Two horses were killed, two European horses were killed in this battle, including DeSoto's, and almost 40 natives died. The defeated natives were enslaved or executed, and the executions were carried out by the Paracoxi Indians who were found to, to be rivals of this group. So, uh, you know, again, interesting situation there where DeSoto is using another tribe to execute these natives. He continues in his travels where he finds another abandoned town with plenty of food left behind to supply the expedition. And I think here at this point, it's important to note that likely information is traveling by word of mouth. Remember, Juan Ortiz first heard about DeSoto through word of mouth. And the fact that these Europeans are treating natives so poorly is likely getting through the area. So people are fleeing their villages. DeSoto at this point sends two captains in opposite directions to find and enslave more natives. These captains end up bringing 100 more natives back to him. There's a, a description here in the writing that I want to read, so let's have a look. They were led off in chains with collars about the neck to carry luggage and grind corn, doing the labor proper to servants. Sometimes it happened that going with them for wood or maize, they would kill the Christian and flee with the chain on, which others would file at night with a splinter of stone in place of iron, at which work, when caught, they were punished as a warning to others that they might not do the like. These folks were so desperate that in small group or, or close one-on-one -on -one combat situations, they would actually kill their captors and flee. And it's unfortunate, but this section also gives us some context as to why this was going on. Their labor was essentially needed to support the expedition. And again, as you know, I don't obviously condone any of this, and as gruesome as it sounds, they essentially needed servants, and that's, this is the way they, they went and did that. The women and children amongst the natives were not chained, but they walked freely, and many of them eventually learned Spanish. They continue on their journey towards Appalachia when they come upon a river that was six feet deep in the center, so they had to build a bridge to get across it. And again, this was throwing logs over brush was their way of building a bridge. This wasn't something that they wanted to create something that was very static. They wanted uh, an item that would just hold up for several hours and it took them four days to do this when they got to the village on the other side of this river having four days to work on crossing it they found the village on fire so the natives there decided to torch the town and take off on october 26th two and a half months after starting that seven day journey de soto and his expedition finally make it to Appalachia. They felt that there was ample supplies there to stay through the winter. I believe if we go back to the Narvaez expedition, we'll find that it didn't take them nearly as long to get to Appalachia. But it's interesting in that DeSoto, again, it, it highlights the difficulty of the terrain in moving that group of people. DeSoto had understood there was an ocean just west of Appalachia. And again, this is from... Cabeza de Vaca's travels. So he sent some men to investigate that. The men come back 
saying that they had found on a shoreline horse skulls and broken timbers. And this turns out to be the site of the Narvaez barge build. Remember when they built those five ships 12 years earlier? So it turns out that they have found that area. And essentially at this point, DeSoto has intersected uh, with the Narvaez expedition of 12 years earlier. While wintering in Appalachia, DeSoto builds defenses to help keep the natives out. However, on November 29th, a native snuck through and set the encampment on fire burning a good part of it. Skirmishes would continue between the natives and the Europeans with casualties occurring on both sides throughout the winter. One of the captured natives, a young boy, told the Spanish that he was from a faraway city called Yapaha. Yapaha is what he said. He said it was a huge town with a queen and neighboring villages with ample amounts of gold. Again, there's that key word, gold. DeSoto decides he wants to head to Yapaha. And so this is where the expedition, instead of following the Narvaez path and heading west, they decide to head north into the American Southeast. And we will see what they found out next time on Historical Context.